Let, let's make that, so much time we have here, let's make that applicable to today. There's a businessman. He's wealthy. All he thinks about is money, 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 money. His reputation, his power, that's all he thinks about. His toys, that's all he thinks about. But every day when he goes into his corporate building, he has to pass by that crazy street preacher that's standing out there preaching about some carpenter from Nazareth. And he hates him. He hates him. But then one day after years, he walks by and he happens to see on the bench a track that that crazy preacher had left. He goes up in his office, he puts it in his briefcase, he goes up into his office and sits down secretly and starts looking at it. What happens? He realizes at that moment he's been wrong about everything. Everything. He's been wrong about everything. I mean, it's like the matrix, like taking the pill. All of a sudden, he realizes he literally has misinterpreted reality. And he's wrong. And what does he do? He quits his business and goes, joins a monastery. Not if he's a biblical Christian. He starts using every one of his gifts, every one of his resources, everything he has for the glory of Christ, for the cause of Christ, and for the benefit of Christ's people. That's what happens. Now, let's bring it down a little bit more. It's a group of girls in school, and I mean in 24 hours, 95% of that time is spent in front of a mirror. I mean, this girl, all she lives for is her beauty, her looks, her parties, her TikTok, her poofy hair and fluffy lips and all the other stuff that goes along with it. That's all she thinks about, her and her friends. Boys, boys, clothes, parties, this, that, emotion, romance, all these things. Does, does my hair look okay? That's all she thinks about. But every day she goes into the cafeteria and she sees this one girl, plainly dressed, sitting over by herself with some book. Her and her friends often make fun of this girl. They laugh at her. They say cruel things to her. But one day, this TikTok girl goes and sits down and says, what are you reading? About Christ, the gospel. Well, what did he do? He did this. And um, why do you, you know, why are you not, why are you so unconcerned about what everyone else is concerned about? Well, there's an inward beauty that I am concerned about. And, and there are so many things in my life that he has taught. And the girl starts listening. And all of a sudden, as she sits there, she realizes she has been wrong about everything. That her beauty was ugly. Her sophistication was stupid. Her entertainment was frivolous. See, same thing, the Apostle Paul. And she stands up and she follows Christ. Do you see that? Let me ask you a question. Would you identify more with the businessman before or after? Would you identify with the young lady before or after? And that's what we're talking about. You see, you are saved by faith alone. You are saved by faith alone. No work whatsoever. You do not save yourself initially. You do not keep yourself saved. You are saved by faith alone. But what you need to understand is that salvation is not merely a human decision. It's not adopting an ethic. It's not joining some culture or group just because they look clean or cleaner. 
When a person is truly, born, is truly, truly believing in Christ, it is because they have been born again, a, a term that has been totally just misused and worn out. Do you know what born again is? It is a supernatural work of God. It's called regeneration, where a dead person, a person who is spiritually dead, that has a heart of stone, according to Ezekiel 36. And what that means is this, that stone is dead. Stone has no sensibility. If I have a statue here of a very large man made out of stone, I can kick it, I can poke it, I can pinch it, and it's not going to respond because it's stone. It cannot respond to stimuli. That is you prior to being born again. That is you prior to being regenerated. And then what happens? The Spirit of God comes and turns that stone into a living heart that is alive, it can respond to stimuli, and more important, it can respond to the voice of God. And so what Jesus is teaching here is not that we're saved by, walk, by means of walking some path, but that if we are saved, the Spirit of God has so regenerated our heart that we're going to walk in newness of life. That doesn't mean we're going to be sinless. That doesn't mean that we're not going to struggle with sin. That doesn't mean that we're incapable of falling. But what it does mean is we've entered into a whole new reality. Our hearts have been changed. We can look around and see the foolishness of wealth and fame and notoriety and entertainment, and pleasure, and our own reflection in the mirror. We can see now it's useless. It doesn't bring life. It doesn't bring joy. We can see that there's a path of righteousness that is pleasing, that is beautiful, that goes from light to light to light, and from glory to glory to glory. Furthermore, if we have been born again, we have become children of God. That means God has become our Father. And our Father will see to it that we walk in the path. Because He's not like modern fathers. He will see to it. And when we go off the path, he'll come after us and bring us back. That's called sovereignty. My mother was, actually had more sovereignty than, most, than the God of most evangelicals. I remember one time, I always tell this story, I was raised on a cattle ranch. We raised Charlotte cattle and quarter horses. And if you lived on a ranch or a farm, there was one thing about a young boy, eight, nine years old, every crevice in his body was covered in dirt. Because you didn't stay in the house and play video games. You were outside working cattle or hunting or fishing or something. And I remember coming in one time and, well, I was like nine years old, and practically a man. My mom said, take a bath. Uh, not tonight, mom, I don't think so. My mom looked at me and I realized at that moment I had made the biggest mistake any human being had ever made. She, she just looked at me and she said, you will take a bath, okay. <laughs> and I remember going in there and I mean, you know, us boys on those, uh, my, my family's ranch, my uncle's ranch, I mean, we swam in snake-infested ponds and everything else. Water did not bother us. Hunting the swamps, whatever. But something about a bathtub is scary to a young boy. And I remember turning on the water and going like this. Okay, and then grabbing my mom's white towel and cleaning off and is no longer white. I was having a wonderful time, absolutely wonderful time, until my mom walked through that door. 
My mom could haul hay and work cattle better than any man. Her hands were like a horse rasp, sandpaper, cut stone. She scrubbed me until literally the Shekinah glory was coming off of my body. <laughs> she said, you will do this. Now I want you to know that when you become a Christian, God is loving and he is patient and he is kind and he is merciful. But this God is also the God that sometimes will grab you by the back of the neck and say, you will be clean. You will walk no further. My dear friend, my dear young person, if you profess faith in Christ, yet it's just a culture for you, it's just sort of an ethic you've adopted, or it's just you've joined a certain group, you're in danger. If you call yourself a Christian and there is very little desire you, you don't get excited about the statement, do all for the glory of God. You don't desire becoming more and more like Christ and more and more useful to him. Your love for God's people doesn't grow. You need to be afraid. You need to be worried. If you can, and some of you can, live in secret, deadly sin, you need to be afraid because it's very possible that your profession of faith in Jesus Christ is false. It is false. False. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. Let me ask you something. Do you act more like the world? Or do you act more like those serious Christians that you often call a legalist that are the very opposite of the world. What camp do you fit in? Would you be right at home with a group of Afghanis or people from Burma who are in a house church hiding out for the sake of Christ? Or would you feel more at home with a group of worldly people who just piddled their life away, not necessarily even with sin, but just with vanity. Where do you fit? What, what comes out of your mouth the most? Do you talk about Christ when you get together with your friends? Oh, I talk about all kinds of things now. Be careful. If you're one of these Christians who walk around that anytime somebody talks about something other than Jesus Christ, you jump on them, you've got serious problems. I love life, I love all kinds of things in life, but if you listen to me, if you hang around me enough, you'll know that at least the priority there is Christ. What about you? What about you? How much time is Christ found in your conversation? How much time is Christ found in your thoughts? How much time is Christ's word put into your heart by you, not by some preacher, but by you reading scripture? Do you desire to be godly? This place, to some, in some degree, is very, very dangerous. Why? Because it is cleaner. It is more ethical to be here, but that doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is that you trust in Christ and Christ alone. And that you know you're trusting in Christ because you can see him working in you. Even when you're stubborn, even when you rebel, you can see it's obvious he's working in you. It says, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. And then he repeats, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, here's what I don't want you to think. Many of you probably sitting here, you read this passage and you go, yes, he's talking about there are people in this world who call themselves Christians, but that group is really small. 
But then there's another group out here that are worldly and they're not Christians, they're atheistic, they're all this, and that group is really big and that's what he's talking about. No, that's not what he's talking about at all. Do you know what he's saying? He's not comparing the small minority of Christians to everybody else in the world. He's not even talking about the world. He's saying among that group of people who confess me to be Lord, few will enter into eternal life. That's what he's teaching. That's the context. He's saying that there is going to be a multitude of people who are saying, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, and they're going to attend chapels, and they're going to go to Christian schools, and they're going to be raised in a Christian culture from the moment they were born. They're going to be put at the nursery in the church, and they're going to be in church stuff all the way through their life, but they're never going to be Christians. And you say, how do you know that? Look what he says in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me ask you a question. Well, let me say this first. Jesus could have said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But that's not what he said. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Now, if you want to know something about Hebrew language, they emphasize through repetition. Remember? Remember? The seraphim said, holy, holy, holy. The emphasis there is holy, 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 very holy. God is holy. That repetition, we see it also in the book of Proverbs, in the book of Psalms. It's called Hebrew parallelism. The wicked shall not live in the land, the wicked shall be cut off. It's saying the same thing twice. So what Jesus is saying here, not everyone who emphatically and passionately declares me to be Lord will enter into heaven. And there's some of you that should be thinking right now, you know, I've never even emphatically declared him to be Lord, even with my mouth. I mean, I go, yeah, yeah, I'm a believer. No, he's saying not everyone who is emphatic about this And it's openly saying, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Who will enter in? He says, he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Now, groups have taken this, even some even supposed evangelical groups have taken this to say, see, it's faith and works. That's not what he's teaching. Not at all. Salvation is by faith alone, but salvation is the result of a supernatural work of God called regeneration, in which we become new creatures. We have living hearts, and we are going to live a different way. And the evidence that a person has truly become a Christian is that they begin to walk in that way, and they begin to be concerned about the will of the Father. What is God's will for my life? And they don't just say, what is God's will for my life with regard to a career? You see, one of the things about the Christian life, the moment you're converted, you know what you start doing? You don't, well, you start reading Scripture. Why? Just so you can win a Scripture memorization competition? No. The moment you become a Christian, you begin to read Scripture because you want to know what the will of God is so that you can live according to that will. And what he's saying is this, the true Christian, again, although the true Christian can be stumbling and bumbling and two steps forward and three steps back, their life is going to be marked by being very concerned about what God's will is. What does God desire from me? Is that you? Are you concerned about the will of God? You know, one of the most important doctrines in in Christianity regarding the word of God is often left totally out. 
People say, I believe the Bible's inspired. Great. I believe the Bible's inerrant. Great. I believe the Bible's infallible. Wonderful. But here's the question. Do you believe the Bible is sufficient? Because if you don't, then everything else you've said doesn't matter. And sufficiency means this. When I found the person I was going to marry, what did I need to do? Go to the scripture to find out what does it mean to be a biblical husband and submit my life to that and not do what is right in my own eyes. When you preach or teach or when you worship, you do not have... If you come to me and say, I like this kind of worship, I'm going to go, I don't care. I don't care at all. Well, if you don't do this kind of worship, I'm not coming back. Bye. <laughs> Why? Because worship, everything, marriage, even how you manage your time as a student, you go into scripture and you say, Father, what is your will in this area? How should I dress? How should I talk? What should I look at? What should I not look at? You know what that's called today? Legalism. Isn't it amazing? Now, I will give it to you. There will be some students who are just, they're, they're crazy, man. You need to avoid them. But I want to tell you something. Any time it seems to me that a student starts getting serious about how should I order my life according to the scripture, immediately everybody labels him legalist. Look what he says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Let me ask you a question, students. In your studies of how God wants you to use your time, what have you, dis what have you discovered? You say, well, I've never studied that. Well, you maybe need to think about getting started. You're going to be judged for how you use your time. Uh, what you watch at the movies, have you gone into scripture to determine what God wants you to watch and what he says you cannot watch? Well, no, I've never done that, but well, maybe you ought to start. But see, that's the minor problem. The bigger problem is this. Do you really know Christ? Are you trusting in him? And is that manifested by the fact that now you are greatly concerned with, Lord, what is the path you've marked out for me? And that path marked out for you is going to be defined by Scripture. You see, and that's what I want you to see so desperately. So desperately. Are you truly Christian? 